uh, that's related to transition metals. Remember, transition metals, uh, it's all memorization. Just the notes, uh, you need to know a few ligand exchange reactions. Uh, one second, and I'm just uh, where's the one second? So, transition. Uh, metals where, where the notes are uh, transition this one class notes <clears throat> so when it comes to transition metals uh, this one all you have to know about transition metals is that uh, There's a thing called ligand exchange. You hear that's homogeneous, those are properties. Uh, there's some specific reactions which are known as ligand exchange reactions and you have to kind of remember those uh, ligand exchange reactions. So here they are. Uh, there's a metal line and it's surrounded by ligands. Uh, ligands are species which have lone pairs and those lone pairs, they get attracted to the metal line in the middle. Uh, that's what a ligand is. Uh, so you have to know a couple of reactions for copper and cobalt. You have to memorize them. So copper, if it's aqueous, it will be surrounded by water. If you add NH3, then some of the water molecules around it, they get knocked out and they get replaced by NH3. Uh, and that's an octahedral complex, which means that it's uh, six data bonds in both cases. So you have Cu with six water molecules. Now we've got Cu with either six NH3s or some NH3s and some water molecules. And the next thing is, uh, this one is a deep blue solution. This one is a blue solution. This one over here is a deep blue solution. Uh, this is what this looks like. This is what this looks like. You add HCl, HCl has Cl minus one ligand. So the water molecules, they get knocked out and they get replaced by Cl. But that's a tetrahedral complex because Cl is bigger in size. So you can't really fit a lot of them around it. You can only fit four around it. That's a greenish yellow or a yellow solution. And if you add OH ions, uh, then the water molecules, they get knocked out and they get replaced by OH ions. And uh, when OH ions, they uh, join with the copper plus two, it becomes a neutral molecule and it ends up forming a precipitate of copper hydroxide. You get a, uh, you get a pale blue precipitate of copper hydroxide. Cobalt complexes are going to be exactly the same. Cobalt with water, you add OH ions, uh, water gets replaced by OH. You add ammonia, water gets replaced by ammonia. You get, uh, you add Cl, uh, the water gets replaced by Cl. So most of the questions are going to revolve uh, around these. So this one, this one is copper with six water molecules. Separate portion of this blue solution react with aqueous NOH and with concentrated hydrochloric acid give the info, following information for each of these reactions. He's asking for the ionic equation with NOH. So what is what is the equation? It's copper with six water molecules, right? Do you guys, Asina, is this clear? Yes, sir. And it's plus two. And you're going to knock out its OH ions, right? So two OH ions are going to come in. And what will happen is uh, that you will get copper with uh, OH, two OH ions. And you can just write solid and the six water molecules are going to get knocked out. And that's going to be a solid type of reaction that's known as a precipitation reaction. And the copper containing product that's going to be a paid loose solid. That is what is going to happen in this. Um, yeah. Uh, so for the um, transition elements, uh, we can just remember the equation. Are these fixed? Yeah, it's fixed. I mean, you just have to remember exactly all of these reactions. Uh, the one with copper. Because we, so you have to, and cobalt, it's the same reaction. The only thing is uh, the colors are different. That is the only, only thing. That copper hydro, cobalt hydroxide has a green precipitate. Cobalt with NHT, that's brown, and cobalt with water, that's pink. And cobalt with Cl, that's blue. So it's you just have to, with water, which it forms a solid precipitate, that's it. So it's kind of it's kind of fixed. You just have to memorize all of this. 
Is that clear? Yes. I said the other one with hydrochloric acid, same thing. It's uh, cop uh, copper with six water molecules and it has a charge of plus two. And concentrated hydrochloric acid has CL ions. Uh, the four, and remember to add, you want to add arrows, add reversible tickets. These are all reversible. So copper with four CLs, that's two minus, and the six water molecules, they get knocked out. Uh, this one, it's uh, copper is plus two, CL is minus one. So the total charge will be minus two. This is known as ligand exchange. And this is over here, a greenish yellow solution. They were just looking for the color. So that's going to be greenish yellow. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I mean, the equation will be given over here. Add concentrated HCl to copper. It's uh, copper with the four CLs coming and that's greenish yellow solution. That's it. Just repeat the same equations for cobalt as well, but they're going to have different colors. That's it. Asak, now this one, uh, this one is, I think, a Mohl's question. So uh, he's saying calculate the empirical formula of the chloride of sulfur. Show all your work in. So probably looks like a three mark, maybe a difficult question. So he says that there's a 0 0.303 grams of chloride of sulfur. So we don't know what the chloride is. We don't know. We don't know what the formula is. Is it S2Cl2, whatever that is? I have no idea. But I know that it, it has a mass of what, 0 0.303 grams. Is that clear? Yes, sir. And he's saying that it, it, it completely hydrolyzes with water and all the chlorine atoms present in the chloride of sulfur are converted into chloride ions. So it mixes with water. And when it mixes with water, uh, he says that all the chloride turns into chloride ions. So you're going to have Y chloride ions, right? Like if you have, if you have four CLs over here, there's going to be four CL ions, right? And the solution is diluted to 100 cm cube. So now you've got a 100 cm cube solution, and that 100 cm cube solution has chloride ions in it. And then he says that a 25 cm cube sample of this solution is titrated. So he takes a 25 cm cube sample of these CL ions, right? And he reacts it with silver nitrate. So silver and CL ions. So the silver ions from silver nitrate are going to react with it. And the concentration is given. That's 0 0.05 mole per dm cube. And the volume of silver nitrate that, ne that is needed is 22.4 cm cube, right? So we get this at the end, right? So this is the whole, idea that uh, hydrolyzes the CL ions over here, they turn into CL ions aqueous. This is what he said. And uh, it, he turned it into a hundred cm cube solution, then took 25 cm cube CL ions and reacted with silver nitrate, uh, where all the silver ions are coming from. So what, how many moles do you have over here? Uh, 0 0.05. Yeah, that's the concentration. This is the volume. So moles is what? It's concentration times volume, right? Yes, sir. And the volume must be in decimeter cube. So, so what do you get? Um, that's... 1.12 times 10 to the power of negative 3. 1 point? 1.12 times 10 to the power of negative 3. Negative 3 moles, TK. So that, that's these many moles. Uh, CL ions will have exactly the same moles then, right? Uh, why? Because it's, I mean, the equation they've given you, the equation that it says that they react in one ratio one, right? So is that clear? I mean, is this clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Asha, so, but that's the amount of CL lines in 25 CM cube. What is the amount of CL lines in the 100 CM cube of the original solution? Look at 25. So, you, you're going to use ratios that in 25 CM cube of the sample, you had these many moles. So, in 100 CM cube, it's going to be four times, right? Yes, sir. So, what is four times this? It's, uh, what do you get? 4.48? Uh, 4.48 times 10 to the power negative 3. Moles, right? Yes, sir. So, you got 4.48, uh, 48, sorry. So, you got you got 4.48 and times and 4.48 times 10 to the minus 3 moles, right? So you got the you got the amount of CLs. Now, now based on that, now all that CL is coming from uh, this formula over here, right? So you can figure out the mass of the CL, right? Like if I multiply by the atomic mass of CL, the molar mass, thirty five point five. So what can I, what, what I'll get is I'll get the mass of CL. So how much is the CL in this? Because all the CL is coming from here, right? What do I get? Uh, 0 0.116. 0 0.116? Yes, sir. So that means that CL is 0 0.116 grams, right? Eh? Uh, no, sir. It's 0 0.116. 0 0.16. Yes, sir. So it's anyway so it's 0 0.16 grams now you can solve the question because the total mass of the whole thing was 0 0.303 grams and you figure out that the seal that you have that's 0.16 grams subtract 0 0.16 from this and you'll find the mass of silicon as well uh, so what do you get for that not silicon it's sulfur uh, 0 0.14 sir one four three or one four? Oh yes, one four three. So you're getting zero point one four three grams. So I figured out that out of this point zero three grams, there was point one six grams of CL and there was uh point one four three grams of sulfur. Now you can figure out how do you calculate the empirical formula? You divide by the uh, molar mass, which is thirty five point five. You divide this by the molar mass of sulfur, which is 32.1. As of this one, I already know because this is, we got it from here, right? So I already know how many moles of CL I've got. So I've got 4.48 times 10 power minus 3. I mean, you can you can try it again. It's You're going to get the same answer. How many moles of sulfur do we have? Mass over molar mass. Um, 0.1483. Divide by three. Uh, four point four point four five times ten to the power negative three. Three moles, right? So you can see that it's kind of the same moles, right? It's approximately the same moles. Like what? What ratio is this? It's one ratio. One it's, ratio one. So that means uh, they have the same ratio. It's SI is one. So you don't SI. S is one. And CL over here is also one. So the empirical formula is coming out to be S1 CL1. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Just remember, this was kind of a difficult question in the sense that they uh, kind of a layered question. Um, yeah, I said you would go through this question at the end, like later when we're almost done. Uh, the same question. Yes, sir. Okay. I said the next one. Uh, decomposition and thermal stability of nitrates. And this is about uh, group two, right? It's uh, mostly about group two. Uh, and you're being asked to predict. Uh, so this one. Every nitrate, you can remember decomposition. You just have decomposition of nitrates and carbonates now. Every group two nitrate is going to decompose in the same way. Uh, it's going to be uh, SR is plus two, so 
it's going to form water metal oxide plus NO2 plus oxygen. And the, every time it's going to be balanced in the same way. So you're going to get a question either on the decomposition of a nitrate or a carbonate. They're going to ask you about carbonates as well. Carbonates will be, you're going to get a metal oxide plus carbon dioxide. So every group two metal nitrate or carbonate, it's going to decomp decompose in this exact, in the exact same way. Now, uh, the thermal stability of group two nitrates changes with increasing atomic number. So you have to explain why. Now this is about group two, that the stability of group two nitrates, uh, it increases down the group. Uh, and you have to explain the reason for that. The reason for that is, I said, when it comes to group two, you, uh, okay, this is, I mean, it's not an A2, but it's an AS thing. Um, most of the, most of the group two is an AS. The part that is in, there's a very small section that's part of uh, A2, otherwise where's the, Inorganic, just a second. Here is the uh, just a second. That's this one. I said there's a very small section of group two that's actually part of A2, and that's related to this thing. The decomposition part, uh, PHC, etc. All of this is this is A two. So just this very last section, the thermal decomposition of nitrates and carbonates. That's the only part that's in A two. Uh, carbonates will decompose and nitrates will decompose. That's how we wrote the equation. Remember, NO two is a brown gas. But thermal stability, remember, increases down the group. Uh, like the first two will decompose easily. The bottom two, it's going to be very hard to decompose them. And remember, the bottom two, uh, the Bunsen burner has a has a one thousand degrees centigrade flame. So the first two usually decompose in a Bunsen burner, but the bottom two are not going to decompose. It's going to be a lot harder to decompose the bottom ones. Now the answer to the question is, why do they become more stable? Why is it harder to decompose? And the reason for that is the polarizing power of the ion. The first one at the top, that's magnesium. Magnesium is a small ion. So, and here's your nitrate ion. And at the bottom, you've got, uh, let's say you've got barium or strontium. Barium is a much bigger ion. And here's your nitrate. So the smaller the ion, what will happen is that it has a greater charge density. And the reason you're going to write is why does it have greater charge density? Because it's got a smaller ionic radius. So that means it has more polarizing power. I mean, this plus two is a lot more effective compared to this plus two. This plus two is capable of attracting uh, electrons a lot strongly compared to this plus two. I mean, is this idea clear that greater charge density? Is that point clear? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you've got more polarizing power, right? So what happens is that this plus two will kind of attract electrons from nitrate so strongly that the nitrate ion will get polarized and it will break down. The nitrate will break down into NO2 and O2 because the Mg is strongly pulling its electrons. Uh, it's strongly attracting one of the oxygens. Uh, the Mg will form in magnesium oxide and the rest of the nitrate will kind of break down. So more polarizing power, making the nitrate ion very unstable. So that's why the top one is very unstable. The bottom one is like very stable. It's very hard to decompose this nitrate. It's very hard to actually break it down into NO2 and O2 and oxygen, right? 
And the reason is that there's no one attracting it in the first place. The plus two over here is not really strongly attracting it. So is this idea clear? It's a three mark question. You're going to get a, like a three mark or a four mark question on this, but is this clear? Yes, sir. So uh, just write the trend. Down the group, uh, I mean, you can just write it that up the group, you've got uh, smaller lines, you've got greater charge density. And because they're smaller, they get they have more polarizing power, which makes the NO3 ion very, very unstable. Or the NO3 ion gets polarized and it, it decomposes very easily. Next one is suggest calcium amide will decompose more or less readily than barium. Uh, explain your answer. So the simple explanation for this is that calcium is smaller. I mean, it's got a smaller ionic radius, right? I don't know why it's the same. It looks like the... So it's got more polarizing power. So calcium will decompose uh, more readily compared to barium. Do you get that point clear again? Yes, sir. And then he says that it, it decomposes when heated to form barium nitride. So you just have to write an equation. So barium and NH2 twice. It decomposes to form uh, BA3 into an ammonia and uh, what? As the only product. So you just have to balance it. So I guess uh, uh, three bariums. So I've got uh, how many? Six nitrogens now. So two over here. So there's going to be, I guess, four over here. Uh, so, yep, it looks balanced. He's saying contains the NH2 minus one ions. Predict the bond angle. Explain your answer using the qualitative model of electron pair repulsion. So, so I've got NH2 and it's minus one. Now, here's what N is. N has five electrons. So N has five electrons. N is two means that two of its electrons have formed a covalent bond. And since it's minus one, that means there's an extra electron so that N's outer shell is now complete. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So what do you have around N? Around N, you've got, you've got uh, two lone pairs. That's around N. Forget this, I can't. So, so you got you got two lone pairs around N, and you've got two bond pairs. So if you remember the shapes of the molecules, uh, you got you got a total of four pairs pairs of electrons around N. So when you have four pairs of electrons, the default shape is derived from a tetrahedral arrangement. Like if you have four pairs of electrons, those four pairs of electrons uh, are going to be as far away from each other as possible, and that's a tetrahedral shape. But on two sides, you've got uh, H bonded, and on two sides, you've got lone pairs, right? So that leads to a what kind of shape? That leads to, because there's no atom attached over here. So that shape is known as a bent or V-shaped. Is that clear? Yes, sir. And the angle over here, that's going to be uh, 104 point. That's going to be 104.5 degrees. You guys remember, at least remember the basic shapes, like uh, when it comes to shapes, uh, again, AS, yes, uh, this part. So shapes, this is a quick recap. Two bond pairs, that's uh, linear. Three bond pairs, fan shaped. Four bond pairs, that's tetrahedral. But in this, there's going to be a lot of variations. Uh, so there's going to be 
like in four bond pairs if you have in four bond pairs you've got a 109.5 degree angle but if you've got uh, three bond pairs and you've got a lone pair on top it's the same shape but there's nothing attached on the top so that's like a pyramid it's it's trigonal pyramidal and the angle because of the lone pair is going to shrink a little bit so it's going to be 109.107 uh, in this case and then you can have two lone pairs and you've got two bond pairs uh, so the lone pairs are not counted in the shape there's nothing attached over here on the on those on that side so the angle shrinks a little bit more that's 104.5 so so you've got to remember at least these basic shapes three bond pairs uh that's uh 120 and this would be another variation where you have one lone pair and you've got two bond pairs that's that's going to be slightly less than 120 because there's going to be extra repulsion but anyways, make sure you revise your shapes. Uh, and the explanation will be, you have to explain the electron pair repulsion model. So you're going to explain that there's two lone pairs and two bond pairs. That's pretty much it. That's, that's going to cover your explanation. That you're just going to exp explain that uh, the lone pairs exert greater repulsion, which is why the angle shrinks and it's 104.5. Now this equation. Is the previous question clear? Yes, sir. This question is about electrochemistry. So the first part is you've got ClO3 minus 1 and it reacts with SO2. So ClO3 minus 1, it reacts with SO2 and the product is going to be ClO2 and SO42 minus. That's going to be your product. Uh, so the equation is pretty much in front of you. Uh, remember, it's a it's a redox equation. Can you tell me the oxidation state of Cl over here? Um, uh, is it plus two Cl? No, the plus two. The ClO3 minus one. Like Cl is unknown x. Oxen is minus two, right? Oh, yeah. And there are three of them. And the total charge must be equal to minus one. So what do you get? Uh, four. Four or plus five? Uh, five, sir. So this one over here is, uh, is plus five. And what is sulfur over here? Uh, plus four. Yeah, that's plus four. What is uh, Cl over here? Um, uh, plus two. Plus four. Okay, so it's uh, plus four. And what is sulfur over here? Uh, minus six. No, it's going to be plus six. It's uh, sulfur is x. This is minus two times four, and the total charge is equal to minus two. So if you take plus eight to the other side, uh, it's going to be plus six. Is that clear? Yeah. Yes, sir. So this one is plus six. Now, remember, whenever you have a redox equation, how are you going to balance it? Uh, you're going to balance the number of electrons lost in game. So you, got, you go from plus 5 to plus 4. So that means there's a gain of one electron, right? And sulfur is going from plus 4 to plus 6. So that means uh, it's losing two electrons, right? Is that clear? Yes, sir. So you gain one electron. So the electrons gain and lost, they must be equal. So I will multiply this by two. And I will multiply that by one. Is that clear? To make the to make the electrons gain and lost equal. So that means I should have two seals. And I should just have one sulfur. So I'm, I'm not going to multiply it with anything. Uh, so if I if I do that, the equation will then be balanced. 
like six oxygens plus two, that's uh, eight. Four plus four, that's eight. And the electrons are already balanced. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I said, next one, what, what is meant by disproportionation? Uh, uh, is, is it when electron loss and gain are equal? Is when the, when the same element gets oxidized and reduced. Gets oxidized. And reduced at the same time. So, uh, if you have a look, I mean, let's get rid of this. So, anyways, uh, this reaction over here, this one is uh, is uh, disproportionation. Why? Because uh, what is the oxidation state of Cl over here? Um, this year. Uh, plus two, sir. Plus. Plus four. What is the oxidation state of Cl uh, over here? Uh, three, sir. Yes, yeah, so this one. Yeah. I said this one is plus uh, three. And uh, this one, the other one, what's the other one? Plus five. So you get that one is plus five. So this is disproportionation because CL is getting reduced. It goes from uh, plus four to plus three, so that means it gains one electron, but it goes from plus four to plus five as well. So that means it uh, loses one electron, right? So it is getting reduced and oxidized at the same time. That is what this proportionation is. Is that clear? Yes, sir. And now he's saying deduce the eidic half equations. So there's a reduction equation and there's an oxidation equation. So I'm going to write both equations. What is reductions? Plus four goes to plus three. That means ClO2, where Cl is plus four, uh, forms what? It forms ClO2 minus one, right? And in this case, Cl is plus three. So that means how many electrons did it gain? Went from plus four to plus three. So how many electrons did it gain? Um, one. Because we gain one electron. And I'm going to write the oxidation equation. Uh, it goes from plus four to plus five. So the same ClO2, where Cl was actually plus four, it goes all the way to plus five, ClO3 minus one, where Cl is plus five. So how many electrons did it lose? It lost one, right? Is that clear? Yes. Yes, sir. So those are my reduction and oxidation half equations. The only problem is that one of the equations is not balanced. What? Which one is that? Uh, I mean, the first equation is balanced. One Cl, one Cl. Two oxygens, two oxygens. So it is balanced, right? The first one. Is that clear? Yes, sir. The second one is not. Uh, so what do I do if I want to balance the second one? So whatever's left over here, I'm, I'm going to add it to the second equation because the first one was the reduction equation was already balanced, right? So I'm going to add these two OHNs over here. And I'm going to add this water molecule over here as well. Is this atomized balanced now? Like how many oxygens I've got? I've got four oxygens. And I've got three plus, there's one oxygen over here, that's four as well, right? So is that balanced? Yes, sir. So why did I, 
why did I put all the leftover stuff over here in the second equation? Remember this idea that your overall equation is what? It's the reduction equation plus the oxidation equation that gives you your overall equation. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So that means if I anything that is over here came from these two equations, you add reduction and you add the oxidation, you should get this thing. So, so if in the reactant side you had two OH minus one, there should have been two OH minus one either over coming from this equation or it must be coming from this equation, right? But the first equation did not need anything because it was already balanced. So that's why I put the two OH ions over here. Is that clear? Yes, sir. And anything in the products that's coming from the products over here. So you, you got ClO2 minus one, so you got ClO2 minus one over here. You got ClO3 minus one, you got ClO3 minus one as well. The only thing was where were you getting the water from? So uh, it must be coming from the second equation. So anyways, we've split this into two, two half equations. Now what you have is the next one. You've got a lithium iodine electrochemical cell, which is used to generate electricity and use data to write half equations for the reaction taking place at the two electrodes. So it's a lithium iodine electrochemical cell. If you open the data booklet, uh, if you open the data booklet, you'll notice that uh, so what you'll notice is here's lithium. There's only one reaction for lithium and that's minus 3.04 volts. And here's your iodine. There's only one reaction for iodine as well and that's 0.54. So he's talking about these two reactions. So lithium I'm going to copy those reactions. Lithium plus one electron, that's lithium. And that's minus 3.04 volts. And I've got iodine plus two electrons in equilibrium with the uh, 2i minus one. And that is 0 0.54 volts, right? I said, what I need now is, uh, in electrochemistry, what is the rule? That the higher potential is the one that's going to gain electrons. And the lower one is the one that is always going to that is always going to lose electrons. So the higher is the one that's going to gain. And the lower is the one that's going to lose. Is that clear? Uh, yes, sir. Asha, so many and hence write the overall equation. So so remember, you were not supposed to write the whole equation. You had to write it in the reverse direction. Like right? this is going backwards and this is going forward. Uh, you need to balance the number of electrons lost and gained. So, so I'm going to multiply the first equation by two. Uh, the overall equation is I'm going to add up the reactant. So it's two lithiums and uh, iodine reacting and the products that are formed in both cases. In the top one, it's 2Li plus 1. And in the bottom one, the product that is formed is 2I minus 1. Do you guess this clear? Uh, yes, sir. And calculate the inert cell. The inert cell is reduction potential. minus your oxidation E naught. So that is uh, higher minus lower, which is 0 0.54 minus the lower one, which is minus 3.04 or reduction minus oxidation. This is reduction and this is oxidation. So that gives me what 3.58 volts. Is that clear? Is this clear? Yes, sir. So now this is about uh, calculation in electrochemistry. So, so remember, you need two things for this. One is Q is equal to IT. Current into time gives you charge. That's from physics. And you need Faraday constant, which is 
that if you have one mole of electrons, the one mole of electrons, the charge on one mole of electrons is 96, 500 coulombs. So two things, Q is equal to I, current into time, and one mole of electrons, it's got a charge of 96, 500 coulombs. Now, uh, you're given, so he's asking for the time. And he says that 0 0.10 grams of lithium electrode can, is to be used up. So he's talking about this reaction. The lithium gets used up, it turns into lithium ion. So I'm going to write this equation. That my lithium is turning into lithium plus one. So I'm, I'm given the mass 0 0.10 grams. So how many moles is that of lithium? That's, uh, I don't know, lithium is I think 6.9. The molar mass of lithium is 6.9. So how many moles is that? Uh, 0 0.023. Okay, so that's 0 0.023. 0 0.023. Keep, make sure you use the more accurate value on your calculator. Uh, I mean, over here, everything should be written to two central figures. So 0 0.023 is fine when you're writing it. How many electrons will be produced based on that? It's going to be the same moles, right? So it's going to be 0.023 moles, right? Now, if you know the moles of electrons, you can figure out the charge because you know that one mole of electrons carries a charge of what, 96, 500 coulombs. That's the Faraday constant. So point, uh, zero, two, three moles of electrons will have how much charge? Uh, zero, two, three yeah. Uh, two, two, one, nine, point five. So three, two, one, two, 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 zero. How much? Uh, two, two thousand, two hundred twenty. Uh, two thousand, two hundred twenty coulombs, right? Now you were supposed okay. to calculate time. So now I'm going to, I know the charge is two thousand, two hundred twenty coulombs, right? I know the current as well. That's 2.5 times 10 power minus 5 amperes. So current into time. So I can figure out time now. So what do we get for time? Um, uh, 8.8 8 times 10 to a power of 7. Uh -oh, 8.8 8 times 10 to a power of 7. Seconds, right? Yes. So that is the time that you're that you're getting in this case. Ah, so that's it. So that's your that's your question. Remember Q zero IT and one mole of electrons that carries a charge of ninety six five hundred coulombs. Is that clear? Yes. Sir. And in electrochemistry, remember that uh, the higher potential gains and the lower potential. E naught cell is reduction E naught, which is the higher one gains electrons, minus the lower one, which is the oxidation E naught. Now the next one. Uh, so that's easy. It's uh, this one is specifically PZ. That's an S. What orbital is this one? I said, it's, I mean, what, what, what is the type of orbital? Um, it's just one mug. I don't think they were just looking for SP or D. So what type of orbital is this? Um, is it BYZ? D Y no, I don't think it's 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 a D orbital, but it's not D Y Z. I think because uh, the orbital lies between the Y 
and the x axis, right? Yes. Sir. If it's if it's exactly lying between the y and x axis, um, then that's the d y d x y orbital. Okay, the z-axis is just coming out of the page. It's not, uh, the orbital is probably not lying over there. But anyways, I don't think they were looking for, uh, they just wanted S, B, or D, I guess. It's just one more question. I said, anyways, um, explain why cadmium is not a transition metal. He's saying cadmium forms two ions. So there's cadmium, um, this thing and electronic configuration of cadmium in these ions is shown. So why do you think cadmium is not a transition metal? It does not have an incomplete D subshell. Okay, so the ion, uh, stable ions should have incomplete D subshells. So it cannot form colored compounds. So any transition metal, it must have uh, the D subshells must be, I mean, these D subshells over here, they got to be incomplete. The uh, cadmium does not have that. Uh, metal, uh, methylamine is a monodented ligand state. What is meant by the term mono, monodented that it's capable of forming only one data bond. So I mean, you can write that down. It just forms, it's a, it's a ligand that forms only uh, one data bond with the metal ion. Now we've got a ligand exchange reaction that's happening. He's saying that in the presence of aqueous methylamine, the cadmium reacts to form a mixture of two isomeric octahedral complexes. So remember first thing, it's uh, it's an octahedral complex. That means, that means all data bonding will happen on the axis X, Y, N and Z axis. So they're going to they're going to happen on the axis, and so you're seeing it has to form a mixture of two octahedral complexes. Complete the three-dimensional diagram to show the isomers of this. Uh, use L to represent this thing in your diagram. Uh, so there are four methylamines. There's two water molecules. So the two water molecules can be opposite to each other. And the rest will be methylamine. That's L, another L with its lone pairs, another L. Is that clear? Yes. And the other one will be that the water molecules will not be 180 degree apart. Uh, they'll actually be right next to each other. You got a water, you got a water 90 degrees to it. And the ligand, which is methylamine, that will be in these other areas, right? So, so basically we draw the cis and trans. So this is basically your cis and trans, right? I mean, this is your, these are your trans ones. Uh, that's your, that's your cis one. Water being right next to each other, right? State water is meant by the term stability constant. So, uh, so how would you define that? That's, that's the equilibrium constant for the ligand exchange reaction. So uh, let me just open the, which paper is this? S nineteen four three. Just a second. So stability constant is just the equilibrium constant for the for the ligand exchange reaction. This is question number. It's a 
question number four, uh, stability. Sorry, this is, I mean, this is which paper? This is 7943, sorry. So question number four. Uh, equilibrium constant for the formation of a complex ion in solution. So it is the equilibrium constant. Uh, so just remember this definition, equilibrium constant for the formation of a complex ion in solution. So it is the equilibrium constant of a ligand exchange reaction uh, in which what happens? Uh, in which a particular complex gets formed. For example, over here, uh, there's an ion and it's the equilibrium constant for, for the formation of a complex ion. This complex ion is getting formed in solution. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So it's part uh, of, yeah. Uh, for this is in trans, can we just write like L or do we have to write ligand? They actually in the question. If you if you read the question, they said uh, use L. All right, okay. To represent, I mean, basically it was methylamine. I mean, in reality, it was it was this molecule which was uh, CH three and NH two, right? And the N had the lone pairs. That was L. Is that clear? Yes, sir. As I said, anyways, uh, it's the it's the equilibrium constant for uh, the formation of a complex ion in solution, in an aqueous solution. Now, complete the table placing one tick in each row to suggest how increasing temperature will affect case stability and the equilibrium concentration of the complex. Uh, this one for equilibrium one, explain your answer. So, increasing temperature. It's an exothermic reaction, right? Higher temperature, which reaction would be favored, forward or backward? If you, uh, you, if you increase temperature, endothermic or exothermic, what happens? Uh, Whenever endothermic? You, endothermic, right? So, so it's the endothermic that's the endothermic is going to be the backward reaction, right? Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay, so your case stability in this case, uh, I mean your product concentration divided by your divided by your reactant concentration, right? That value will decrease, right? Uh, the product will be lesser, and the reactant. So, what will happen? Lesser product, more reactant. So, the case stability value will decrease. Is that clear? Uh, yes, sir. So it decreases, and you're going to state uh, uh, higher temperature. You, if temperature goes up, uh, endo is favored, right? And you get backward reaction, or the equilibrium shifts backwards, right? So that is going to be your exp explanation. I said there's another. Uh, what was this thing? What's the second row? Case stability decreases. I said, what about the concentration of this thing? It will also decrease, right? Because if it's going backward, there's going to be less of this formed. Now you've got uh, this eta, which is a polydentate ligand. And when a solution of eta is added to water, a new complex, okay, uh, a new complex is formed. Um, and the values of the stability constant for the two, the two are given. I said, when you have a bigger value, that means there's more chances of this forming. Is that clear? Like, like if case stability over here had a bigger value, that means more of this will be formed, more of the products will be formed. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So remember, whenever case stability has a bigger value, more products are going to be formed. Uh, so in this case, case stability 
has a much bigger value. So there's more chances of this forming. There's more products that will be formed. So a solution containing equal moles of uh, uh, methylamine eta in this uh, predict which complex is formed in the large amount. So that's pretty easy. It's uh, I mean, just right. It's it's got a bigger value. So this is the one that's going to form. That's it. It's just a one mark question. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So more chances of this product forming rather than that product forming because that's got a smaller value. Uh, next one is write an equation showing how methylamine dissolves in water to give an alkaline solution. So, so you're saying that it's a it's a base. What does a base do? It accepts what H plus one ions. So I got uh, methylamine. He's saying how does it react with water? So it reacts with water and it will accept an H plus one. So one of the H plus one over here will jump from here and will be accepted by this thing. Why will it be accepted? Because it's got load pairs, right? So CS3, it will instead become CS3 NS3 plus one. And similarly, OH ions will be left. Is that clear? That's it. So that's uh, what's going to happen. Methylamine is a useful reagent in organic chemistry and writing equation for the reaction of... Uh, so we'll do this later on. Uh, I'll come back to the original question. I just remember I'll, I'll, we can start with the same paper. So I'll just add it here. Asha, uh, Sasina, uh, you want to discuss this question again? Uh, yes, sir. So this question was that uh, they took a chloride, 0 0.03 grams. He said that it was hydrolyzed and all the chloride of sulfur was converted into chloride ions. So the solution had Cl ions. So all the Cl over here it turned into CL ions. And he said that he made it up into a 100 cm cube solution. And then he took a 25 cm cube portion of this solution, which had CL ions, and reacted it with silver ions, right? And, he, and they gave us the volume and concentration of silver ions. So what you did was, you figured out the moles of silver ions over here. Using that, you were able to figure out the moles of CL ions because they were going to be exactly the same. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So you found out the amount of CL ions in this tiny 25 cm cube solution. So in the original 100 cm cube solution, the moles will be four times greater, right? Because, yes, so you found out the moles, and where did all the CL lines come from? They came from this thing, right? So all these 4.48 times 10 power minus 3 moles CL lines, they're coming from this thing, right? So what is the mass of CL? You multiplied it by the molar mass and you got that it came out to be 0.16 grams. So all this 0.16 grams of CL ions, they actually came from this thing over here, right? So the next question was about empirical formula. So the whole thing had a mass of 0 0.03 grams. So how much is the mass of CL over here? That's 0.16 grams. What is, what is the mass of the rest of the sulfur? You subtract that from 0 0.03, you get 0.143 grams. Is that clear? Um, yes, sir. And the rest is empirical formula. If you know how empirical formulas are calculated, you divide by the molar mass, 35.5 and 32.1. You get the moles, and then you try and figure out what, what is the whole number ratio, right? Yes, sir. And the whole number ratio almost came out to be 1 ratio 1. So that means the empirical formula is going to be S1 and Cl1, right? Um, yes, sir. Okay, go ahead, sir. 17. Let's continue uh, tomorrow then. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, then. Take care, everyone. Good night, sir. Thank you, sir. Love